Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with Mildred, who just got up from her nap and is giving herself a, a bath here or a shower or something. Right, Mildred? Isn't that it? Yes, that's the idea. Oh, isn't she cute? Yeah, well, I'm talking, we're here to talk about while well, she woke up for this, because this is really major. Major, major, major. An enormous find in the history of music. And you know, every so often something pops up. And it's always exciting when that happens. And there's a tendency, in this case, there's going to be a tendency for it to be dismissed, because it's the Fantasia Symphonica, Fantasia Symphonica, by Franz von Suppe. I mean, come on, Suppe, right? Light cavalry. You know, the poet and peasant. Yeah, all that stuff. Suppe was a wonderful composer, a first class composer who developed this sort of melange of styles from Italian opera, and he invented the Viennese operetta. And you know, he was like sort of Sir Arthur Sullivan, who was, of course, the greatest English composer ever, and certainly, you know, the greatest composer in the 19th century, let's put it that way, at a minimum, but I would say he was even better than that, really just amazing. And so was Suppe. I, he had, because he worked in the theater, let's put it this way, he had no inhibitions when it came to writing music in other formats. But he understood what the deal was. I mean, you know, what the idiom was. And that is why the Fantasia Symphonica was not called a symphony. It is a symphony. It's in four movements. It has a gorgeous opening allegro in sonata form with a beautiful introduction, a stunning slow movement, um, a, a, a jolly scherzo, and a grand finale. And, you know, the fact that, it, I mean, it's a symphony, but he couldn't call it that. Why couldn't he call it that? It's a really interesting question in, in aesthetics and the conundrum of, of German aesthetics, particularly in, in the mid-19th century, when, you know, the idea of writing a symphony meant a certain austerity and sobriety of approach. And if you didn't do that, then you would get shat upon by the powers that be. I mean, remember, remember that, you know, Franck had a riot in 1888 because his symphony in D minor used a harp and an English horn. Ah! Uh, you know, that kind of stuff. And Suppe, who was not one to pull punches or to give up, you know, every resource that he could have at his disposal, he was already an incredibly gifted melodist, and there's plenty of great tunes in here wonderful tunes and fantastic orchestration. He's writing along, he's, he's whizzing along with the finale of this piece. And then, and then this happens. Now, do you understand why he could not call it a symphony? All of that percussion comes whizzing in, including the tam-tam at the end. Wow, baby, he used the tam-tam. I gotta love a guy who in the mid-1850s is writing tam-tam parts in his orchestral works. There's somebody who is enlightened and forward thinking, but symphonies generally, unless they were called like military symphonies or had some program, some sort of programmatic something to explain it, did not use the arsenal of uh, the normal theater orchestra, the theatrical overture, the things that you know composers would 
normally normally employ if they were writing for uh, the stage. One of the things that Beethoven did actually that is so seldom discussed um, and acknowledged is that he opened the orchestra up to theatrical effects by using things like piccolos and contrabassoons and trombones and you know Haydn's percussion from the military symphony and things like that. You know, Beethoven understood the value of using, you know, theatrical coloristic devices in the symphonic context. But for most composers, uh, the most that you could actually do would be what like Schumann did in his Spring Symphony, use a triangle, or Brahms in his fourth. You know, to do anything else was was considered program music or theatrical music. And that risked putting you in the later in the century into the progressive Wagner list camp of composers. I mean, you know, the, the attitude towards these, this thing, these things got more and more rigid and dogmatic as time went on, as the 19th century went on. So this Fantasia Symphonica was written in 1859. And in 1859, you could not end a symphony the way Mr. Suppe ends his Fantasia Symphonica. So he didn't call it a symphony. But that's what it is. Last 31 minutes, it's a symphony. And it's a wonderful symphony. It's one of the great mid-century Austro-German symphonies. No question about it, hands down, and it should be played every 15 minutes from now until the end of time. It won't be, because people would have to think and make a conscious decision in order to do that. And it's just so much easier not to do that when you can be playing Bruckner. <laughs> you know, who would gradually learn to use a symbol and triangle, but wouldn't do anything else. No, 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 no. This is great stuff. And it's wonderfully played by the Tönkünstler Orchestra under Ola Rudner, who discovered the piece and edited it for performance. Thank God. I mean, can you imagine these things just lying around in an archive somewhere? Depressing, isn't it? And we also get the Poet and Peasant Overture, and we get Morning, Noon, and Night in Vienna, and the Sailor's Homecoming, some some bits of that. And finally, the exhibition at the Carl Theater Overture Preludium. Really some, some rare things. That's a world premiere recording of that too. Some interesting and eclectic soupe, and he's just good. He's just a good, solid composer. I mean, you listen to his music and you just know that this guy knew what he was doing and how to do it. And you want you'll want to hear this. You really will want to hear this. I guarantee it. It's a, it's a genuine, sensational discovery. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.